Hey guys, you're watching the Best Practices Show. We're taking a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all across the country. And one of the very hottest topics in all of dentistry is airway. And today you do not want to miss this. I have one of my good friends, Dr. Jeff Rouse from Spear Education on today. And he's going to be talking about the single greatest tools for helping you diagnose or screen for airway. Don't miss this. Just do me a favor, grab a pen and hit the share button. We'll see you in a second. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to the Best Practices Show. Again, having so much fun doing this and uh, so grateful for your comments. We are now into season two, episode 95, and we're not even a year into this, kind of figuring it out as we go and uh, pretty, pretty fun. We're close to 20,000 followers on Facebook and then over 50,000 have found us on iTunes. So keep giving us suggestions for things you want to see and we'll do the best we can to get them on. Couple show notes before I introduce my amazing guest today. We are shooting this live. So as you have questions, if you have questions while this is, uh, while we're live, please ask them in the feed and I'll ask Dr. Rouse directly and we'll do our best to see if we can't give him um, the question and we'll get an answer straight for you. Also, if you're watching this later on, continue to add questions to the feed and we'll, we'll keep giving you the answers you're looking for. So my guest today, good friend of mine, Dr. Jeff Rouse, I've known him for quite a long time now and watched you grow and you're out there speaking all the time. It's pretty cool. And today we're going to be talking about the best tools for airway screening. Now I know who you are. A lot of people that watch this show know who you are, but if somebody doesn't know who Dr. Jeff Rouse is, can you give us a little background on who you are and what you do? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me on again. Uh, always fun to be here. Um, yeah, I'm a, a prosthodontist. I actually have two practices. I've got a practice in San Antonio, Texas. I've got a practice up in Seattle, Washington. Up there, I practice with Greg Kinzer and Frank Spear. Some people have heard those guys' names. Um, I also teach out at Spear Education with, with them as well. Uh, my focus has... Well, in 2007, I started doing some work with bruxism, and eventually that evolved into airway issues and how they relate to bruxism. About the same time, I was discovering a lot of the issues that my son, Jake, had and figured out those were airway issues, and that's where it all kind of took off. A fellow was in the practice today. He said, uh, you know, I would refer to you because I think you have some specialty in this. Um, by another dentist. And it's not actually a specialty. It's just sort of a, uh, an interest to focus. And it's one that, um, that interestingly, the, that more and more uh, dentistry is getting into. The last Seattle Studies Club symposium, every single uh, speaker was asked a question about the airway of the patient. So I think this is sort of the way we're going with this today in dentistry. And it was fun to kind of grow up with it. Yeah, absolutely. Now we've mentioned this a couple times in the previous episodes, but I think it's it's worth repeating. Even how you guys look at the pillars of diagnosis, now that has changed completely. It used to be four, now there's five. So this particular particular topic today is critically important when we're talking about tools. So can you discuss the five diagnostic pillars that you guys firmly believe in? Well, the 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 way that Frank Spear introduced the concept of facially generated treatment planning 35 years ago, he talked about aesthetics, function, structure, biology. So aesthetics was you're going to figure out how to set the maxillary incisors and then you're going to work your way back from there, just exactly the same way that you're going to set a denture. The next thing would be you'd figure out how to function, meaning you're going to figure out where the mandible comes in play. And then structure and biology were basically looking at anything that was going to compromise the overall predictability of the case. So everything begins by looking at the face and figuring out where the teeth belong. Well, that was obviously incredibly successful and has spawned off different, um, uh, different thought processes. Bill Robbins and myself 
Uh, we developed a global diagnosis system, and it was based on what Spear and Coys had done, just our little take on it. But it was obviously laid the foundation for what we're doing today. The interesting thing was once I got into the airway part of it, um, I look back at the cases that Bill and I had done together and the ones that Frank had shown for years and realize that you really need to figure out what the airway is doing and how it's compromising the patient. Because of the five reasons Bill and I came up with for um, teeth being in the wrong location or abnormal growth patterns, four of them were airway related issues. So I had been looking at this problem for years. Well. Now that, we're, that I'm teaching at Spear and working with those guys, instead of going aesthetics, function, structure, biology, we're beginning the way they've always begun, by getting disease processes under control, perio, muscle issues, that type of thing. But first and foremost, we're figuring out, is the airway compromised? Um, if you start figuring out where the teeth belong and you get all the way through your treatment plan and then you say, oh, you know, this patient's got a really severe airway issue, your diagnostic tree of making choices changes pretty dramatically. What you would have in the past said, well, I'm just going to intrude a couple of teeth and restore them. Nowadays, you may be significantly more aggressive at opening the vertical or changing the dimension of the teeth completely. So orthognathic surgery may be on the table or some more aggressive form of orthodontics that you wouldn't have ordinarily considered. So the fifth pillar is airway. And it actually is the first in that align that alignment so that the thought always as you're making choices is always going to revolve around the airway. Right, right. Now, this is awesome. And I want to get into this because this screen, we've talked about screening tools. This is a hot topic, too, because there's a lot of different ways you can look at screening for airway. And you were you were quick to help me. It's about discovering. It's not about diagnosis. Can you define that? What does yeah. that mean? Well, a dentist can't diagnose a sleep problem and it was actually a breathing problem. We talked about that in the past. Yeah. Um, what we're looking at is breathing problems for the most part. Apnea is a breathing problem. It's not really a sleep problem. The apnea affects the sleep, but it isn't a true sleep issue. Um, and dentists can't call it apnea. What we can say is it appears as if, or it looks like, or I have a suspicion of, but you can't actually tell people you have apnea or you have severe apnea. Um, so our tools that we're looking at using are really screening tools. And the, the way that the staff discusses it and the way that you discuss it with the patient is really important. It should never be uh, discussed as we're doing a sleep study on you because that's not what you're really doing. You're doing a sleep screening on patients or even go further to say I'm doing a screening on your breathing or I'm doing a screening on your sympathetic activity when you are asleep. But never give them the illusion that you have diagnosed them in any way, shape or form. You are simply discovering what uh, what uh, surrounds their sleep and may impact their sleep and therefore impact what you're doing as a dentist. Right, right. And we're going to go through the whole gamut of this from, you know, most affordable to probably the biggest investments. But, um, you know, the misconceptions around these tools are so important because a lot of times people say, well, I'm just going to send you to a sleep study, quote unquote, lab, and that's not often the best thing to do. So walk us through this. Where would I start if I'm a young dentist watching this? Well, let's start with the last thing you said, which is um, that the tendency whenever I teach this information is the, the people in the audience will come up and say, okay, so the first place to start is to go send them to a sleep lab. Mm -hmm. And my answer really is no. I'm not, uh, that is rarely my first step um, for a couple of reasons. One is there, I've not met anyone yet that walked into my office and was exuberant about getting a sleep study and they just right. that's not something people want to do mm -hmm. and i'm fairly gifted at, at talking people into doing say a crown i mean if they need a crown they usually leave scheduled to do a crown but rarely if they need a sleep study in a sleep laboratory do they leave that way so um it, it's a hard thing to do so if that's your beginning step you're going to not get very far the other part of it is that sleep studies and sleep labs really need to be reserved for what I call the fat old man with apnea or anyone that has uh, a bed partner or a parent that actually 
uh, notices witnessed apneic events where they can verify that that's actually occurring or extremely loud snoring, something like that. But I don't just jump on um, most of my patients and get them to go out to sleep studies. And even the fat old man with the wife saying, oh yeah, he holds his breath all the time, I still screen them to create leverage on the patient to get them to do what they were supposed to do. So, you know, the screening, I think, is is the bigger part of it. Um, the example I use is that um, in the past, and, and the way that dentists can do this, in the past, if you went into, your, uh, into the hygiene room and you're checking a patient and you notice some things about the patient, you may have a clue that the patient has high blood pressure, but not until you actually use a tool to show them that they have a high blood pressure is it obvious to them and evident to them that they really ought to see the position. So the tool is pretty powerful when you give them a number uh, or you show them a graph. So I think that's a better way of approaching it. Mm -hmm. So when it, when it comes to the actual tools themselves, you know, a lot of times people think pulse oximeter or things like where, where would you start from in, in all, you all take right. us through so the whole would, range. I would, um, as a, as someone that's just sort of, uh, uh, getting a sense of what this is all about. I think there are two easy ones. The first is you can use questionnaires. Now, the typical questionnaire that is out there is the, the most popular is called an Epworth Sleepiness Scale, Epworth Sleepiness Scale or ESS. Um, there are many types of scales like it. It just so happens to be one of the most popular and it's used in the most research, so you'll see the most about it. And essentially, it just asks questions. What are the odds of you falling asleep doing something? Either I'm not going to do it or I'm going to do it. But it's wildly variable depending on how the patient interprets the question. For example, I had a friend that screened a lady and it said, how likely are you to fall asleep um, watching TV? And she said, zero, I'm not. I'll never do that. And he said, well, that's odd because you've complained in these other areas that you would. And she goes, Oh, no, 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 I never fall asleep. And he said, well, why? And she said, because I don't watch TV. Oh, wow. And, and then he said, well, why don't you watch TV? She said, because I fall asleep all the time. <laughs> so, okay. I mean, so it can be all over the map. And those numbers don't actually lead me personally to a diagnosis. Now, they do mm -hmm. physicians, and they use it that way. They ask questionnaires. They say, your number is a whatever. And they go, you have X amount of odds of having this disease. I would rather just use the questions as a point of conversation. So there is a questionnaire that works good for people that you think has have apnea. That's an Epworth sleeping scale, stop bang scale, Berlin, Wisconsin, all kinds of different scales that you can use and, and you can hand them out to patients. I like to just put them in the chart. Uh, so as they're filling out a new patient e examination form, I have it in there and it just leads me into a conversation with the patient significantly easier than trying to add it on later or have it as some big separate thing. Um, the second one is there is a fatigue severity scale, fatigue severity scale, and that's for patients you believe have upper airway resistance syndrome. And that's your TMD patient, your myofunctional pain patient, your person that's hypersensitive to little airway closures. They'll complain of insomnia and fatigue, um, depression, anxiety, that type of thing. Um, those patients, it's a visual analog scale, and it basically asks how tired are you doing certain things. Mm -hmm. And the last is a, um, a scale on uh, pediatrics or questions on pediatrics. And there are really three of those. One of them is the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry has come up with a scale. Ron Chervin has come up with a scale out of Michigan on sleepy children. And out at Spear, we've kind of done a combination of the two to give you some questions to ask. So you can start by simply asking questions and getting some sense of the problem. The other easy thing to do is almost everyone has a phone app or a Fitbit. And they're great. Now, they give you basically no scientific evidence. And they're getting better. But and someday they will. You'll be able to do all this at home on, a, on an app. But today, remember, we're just discovering. We're not diagnosing, which means that a Fitbit that shows that you didn't sleep very well last night is fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it because all it's doing is saying you're not sleeping very well. And then if you do something, you lose weight, you put an oral appliance in, you 
uh, use a breathe right strip. Then you run a few more nights on it. And if it looks better, then you are succeeding. So um, they're very titratable in that sense. They're just not ultra scientific. Once again, we can't be ultra scientific. We can't diagnose anyway. So why not just discover with those types of tools? So that's if you just kind of want to begin with something easy to do, those would be things that I'd recommend. Yeah. And then obviously you could go into the more complex realm, maybe make an investment. If this is a big part of your practice and the vision in the future, which it ultimately will be for a lot of people, what, yeah. what would be the next, the next layer? So, I mean, to your point about if this is a big part of your practice, um, uh, if it's not, it's because you're not looking, right. um, to be honest with you. Now, you got that to be clear, this isn't about sleep. This is about airway and breathing. And so if you say that sleep isn't a big part of my practice, I'm not making a lot of appliances, that's fine. And I don't either. But 100% of the time I'm looking for airway as a component of, of some of the other dental problems that we may see. So it really ought to be a major player in people's practices. It's not that the patients don't have the problem, it's just that they haven't gotten up to speed with it quite yet. So mm -hmm. if, if and when they get to that point, um, they're gonna want some more sophisticated tools to screen with, in my opinion. And the two that I use, it doesn't mean they're the, the only ones, but it, I, the two that are the most popular that I use, one is HRPO, which is high resolution pulse oximetry. Basically, most of the pulse oximeters you're sent home with today are high resolution, meaning that they read very quickly. They don't have that delay that we used to see for so long. And um, they're really small and easy to use. So they're about the size of a wristwatch. They go on your finger and the patient goes to sleep. I like to have two nights. Some people like to have three nights worth of data. Um, obviously a single night is probably not effective at figuring out what's going on because you can have just an abnormal night, either abnormally good or abnormally bad. So we try to at least have two or three nights worth of data, and these devices usually will hold about five nights worth of data. Um, high resolution pulse oximeter does two things. It measures for oxygen desaturations and it measures pulse rate changes. And some of the more sophisticated algorithms can actually start pairing those two things like heart rate variability with respiration and start giving you a sense of if they're having minor events. But for the most part, a pulse oximeter is designed to look at the fat old man with apnea. So it finds big DSATs, it counts how number, the number of times it happens, um, and then it gives you a number at the end. And the number would, if you were a physician, be a number you could say, um, you know, you have apnea. As dentists, we can't say that. We say it appears as if you may have apnea. You need to see a physician to get your information. Um, so the fat old man with apnea is pretty straightforward. If I think you have apneic events, then I give you a high resolution pulse oximeter. The problem is it doesn't work real well on kids for a couple reasons. One is they don't desaturate very quickly. And so the, the high res pulse ox is built on an adult type of algorithm for looking for apnea. And children, the numbers need to be significantly lower. And the second is just keeping it on is hard for kids to do with little bitty hands. So I've found a, a tremendous amount of error in that. So I don't, I don't do it very much for kids. Um, the other one is the young fit female, the TMD patient. Those patients already have insomnia and they already have all these difficulties falling asleep. And if you put something big on them that squeezes their finger, they're not going to like it. They will not wear it. And so it's almost diagnostic for those patients when they hand it back to me and there's like 15 minutes of data and then it shuts off um, because they couldn't, they couldn't put it on anymore. So for those two patients, I had to find something different. And the, the tool I use is called cardiopulmonary coupling or CPC. It's from a uh, company Sleep Image, Sleep Image. Cardiopulmonary coupling is uh, a single line EKG. It looks at heart rate variability. Heart rate variability is the interbeat dimension or distance between the R waves and in a heartbeat. And the more variable it is, the healthier it is. Basically, the more quiet you are, the more calm you are, the, the fact that the heart doesn't beat with regularity. Um, it, when your heart is beating extremely fast, it beats on the beat. 
Uh, whereas when you're really relaxed, it's a little off every so often. So more variability is a good thing, which seems kind of weird. Um, also through the signal and some algorithms they've got, they're able to actually couple heart rate variability with respiration to find out if your breathing is in sync with it. Then they can find, because this is basically a frequency or a sine wave, they can determine where you're, if you're in sympathetic modes of sleep or parasympathetic. So sympathetic is fight or flight. It's, um, it does happen during dreams, during REM sleep. But for the most part, you want to be in a parasympathetic mode of sleep. Adults, at least twice as much um, parasympathetic as sympathetic. So that your body can do what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to relax. It's supposed to uh, rejuvenate. It's supposed to... Uh, hormones are supposed to be released. Every, you know, your digestion occurs. Everything happens to reboot you for the next day in parasympathetic sleep. And if you're not getting there, then you're going to suffer over time. So those are the two that I use as my main screening tools when we're talking about um, you know things that are affordable to have in the practice, things that are easy to give out for a few days. They were they don't really have. Uh, high cost and disposables. So that's my main go-to. Yeah. Any other range, anything is that do you see in the marketplace that other people are considering as tools that you might yeah. just give some give, give yeah. some context to? Yeah. The other one, the other one that people will have heard about or um, will maybe own is uh, home sleep tests. So, Home sleep testing uh, has some degree of popularity, and um, and I actually think it's a good thing. Um, the in in certain instances, for example, in I was in Halifax a couple of years ago, and in Halifax, there's a two year waiting list to actually get a sleep study done. Wow! So if you've got that long of a waiting list, then obviously having a sleep sleep lab buy a bunch of these. Uh, diet kind of get a sense of who is just the fat old man that needs a very s simple straightforward sleep test done um, Sending those out at home and doing it would be great um, home sleep test has a huge advantage in that you're in your own house and um, You know, you're gonna go to sleep in your own bed and feel very comfortable doing it So it's a huge advantage over doing a polysonography The disadvantage of being in your own house is no one's monitoring you. So I, a lot of times You'll send it home and, and the airflow channel, the nasal cannula will come out and it'll be up, you know, around their eyeball mm -hmm. and you get no data. So mm -hmm. it's no better than a pulse oximeter at that point. Um, it also costs a lot of money and the disposables are expensive. So you're spending thousands of dollars. And so more than likely, you're going to start billing it out through medical. And that adds a level of complexity as well. For example, if you do a home sleep test, bill it out to medical and then decide you need to send it to a sleep physician and they want to run another sleep test in the lab because they, they need to verify something or they need to get better data, they're not going to get compensated for it at that point in time. So that's a right. pretty important flaw uh, to that idea. And the other is it um, kind of like doing interdisciplinary dentistry. If you go put all your implants in yourself, you may not have as good a relationship with the surgeon right. as if you were sending a, you know, sending them out. So um, it, it, it's going to have some effect there. Um, but if there's a long waiting list, if you're in an area without good access to a sleep lab, that would be a place I would use it. If you're in an area with access to only one sleep lab or two sleep labs and they both are acting like jerks towards you, then yeah, I mean, that would be one, a time when I'd probably use it. Um, I have one in my office where I, uh, I, I rarely use it and I use it for a couple of reasons only and that is if they say I'm not going into a sleep lab and yet I still want the data then I have an option for them um, and the other is the one I use happens to monitor bruxing and I have an interest as I said in bruxism since the you know early 2000s and so I wanted to I'm, I'm able to accumulate data that way as well. Yeah. Now, this is so huge. And I just want to go a little bit more into the why on this, because the thinking and the screening behind this lends itself to the other things that happen after it. And you mentioned one third of all patients actually need to see be seen by a sleep physician. And you had a patient recently come to you that um, 
because typically the diagnosis is CPAP, CPAP, CPAP. And there's other things that we need to consider. You had a tall patient come to you. This is a great story. Can you tell that yeah. story? So the one third number is actually um, sleep physicians sit around all day and they read sleep studies. So they, a lot of times they'll own the lab. Sometimes they actually are just um, uh, working for a laboratory, but a whole bunch of sleep studies will come in and they sit in front of a computer and they verify what the technician has done and, and they sign off on the sleep studies after they've done that. Mm -hmm. um, I, it struck me as weird and maybe, maybe everyone else is fine with this, but it very, it struck me as extremely strange to not see your patient and yet make a diagnosis on it. I mean, as a dentist, I would, I, I can't imagine a situation where I would be really comfortable making a diagnosis on a patient, having never seen them because there's so many little nuances in the world of dentistry that you would want to meet, including the uh, attitude or the uh, emotional component of it that really needs to come into play and you don't know unless you, I mean they're not yes can I diagnose on a photograph yeah I probably can a lot of times with casts and photos but there's a lot to the to the person sitting in front of you that also plays into my choices as a dentist mm -hmm. well come to find out the sleep physicians sit at their desk and read all these sleep studies but they really only have to have a face-to-face -face meeting with only about a third of their patients throughout the year. So one third of patients must be seen by the sleep physician. Um, and in order to, to read all these other studies, and I would bet that number truly, if you went and went to a lab is significantly less than that, that actually get in front of the sleep physician if it, they're extremely busy. So. That means they don't know the emotional component. They don't know the anatomy on the patient. They don't know anything except the patient is a certain height, they're a certain weight, and they have a certain neck size. So they get a BMI with neck size. And then they, they end up getting a description of the patient from the sleep laboratory. You know, the patient looks like this or that and the other. Um, they don't really know the patient. And so uh, I had a patient that came in that had been using that had had a lot of issues over his lifetime, but for the last 12 years had been using CPAP. And the CPAP had brought his numbers down, which is all the really the physicians are looking for. They look for the apnea hypopnea index to get under control to where the numbers seem better. They don't have to necessarily be perfect, they just want them to get better, and that's the way it was with this particular guy. Um, but for 12 years, he had continued to break down. All the things that CPAP and getting the apnea under control was supposed to do, it hadn't done it. So he had had uh, AFib, he, which is a causal component of airway issues. His blood pressure wasn't under control. He had a lot of um, anxiety and depression and emotion. I mean, Every, if you make a list of, uh, you know, low T, everything that you can make a list of that's related to airway components, he kept going through these issues. So now he's got inflammatory disease. He's got he just his system continued to break down, whereas you would expect a person that's using CPAP to not have those issues. The biggest one and his chief complaint is I haven't felt good and energetic uh, and alive for as long as I can remember. I wake up exhausted every day and I drag through life and I, I, it's misery. And so this is a, an extremely common complaint that I'm hearing these days. In fact, uh, interestingly, later in that week, I had another gentleman that came in with exactly the same complaint. CPAP is not making me feel normal. I don't feel like I have any energy. I wake up tired. I go to through the day tired. I go to sleep tired and I never feel rested and relaxed. Mm -hmm. So obviously the CPAP isn't working. It's fighting. And so lots of details came out. First detail is he has seen the physician every year for 12 years and gone over it. And in the end, as like many people will, will tell you, the physician says, that's the best it's going to be, and just live with it. I don't have any other choices for you. Now, he decided to try to be more aggressive, 
He tried an oral appliance and that hurt his jaw. He tried medication and that would make him more groggy. He's, he's tried diet and exercise, all kinds of different things. He's not getting anywhere. And so I brought him in and did an exam. And it was the first time anyone really looked in his mouth and in his nose and really got a thorough exam because I work with an ENT here in the office. And so we looked. And the first thing that we noticed is when he opened his mouth that he had a very shallow airway. And when we did a cone beam on him, he had a, a volume of 68 millimeters squared just for information purposes on a normal height person, say, let's call it six foot. Um, that would, should be a minimum of hundred millimeters squared. So this guy's airway is small. It's extremely small given that he's six five. So that, that was a problem. The second thing we noticed is he has a uvula the size of your thumb and, and the posterior part of his airway was draping pretty significantly into the airway. So he had an incredible obstruction right there, just visually. His epiglottis was malformed and therefore he wasn't able to clear an airway effectively and deal with that. And most importantly, he had broken his nose multiple times and had it repaired after playing basketball for years. He had it repaired. And when the repair was done, he kept complaining about the left side of his nose didn't work very well. It drained, he wasn't able to breathe very well. And when we went in and checked, the left side of his nose was completely scarred shut and it completed, competed uh, for airflow and, uh, and created these, these very strange patterns of airflow that he couldn't possibly breathe. So mm -hmm. he looked at us and said, Don't, wouldn't you think that the physician would have wanted to know all this? And he said, yeah, you'd think that. You'd yeah. think that they would want to figure out that anatomically this guy was going to be a failure and those anatomic issues needed to be taken care of. So I think a lot of our patients are, are getting placed on CPAP or oral appliances or whatever they happen to go on with anatomic discrepancies making it difficult for them to actually breathe correctly. So the exam is really important and un as I said, unfortunately, the exam rarely gets done, uh, especially when you're talking about patients going on CPAP. Yeah, this is a big deal, very big deal. Well, I am so grateful, and I know this is, I know we only get you for so much time today, but these tools are critically important as, as you already mentioned, just the future diagnosis, um, direction of your practice, any other considerations you would say if I'm a young dentist, cause we now we watch the metrics on this. So many young dentists, we have kids in dental school watching this. What would you say to these kids coming out of dental school when it comes to airway and the importance of their future in dentistry? Uh, I would say it's incredibly exciting. I mean, I, um, I, I, can't imagine how uh, uh, how important, how valuable, how gratifying it's going to be being a dentist down the road. Mm -hmm. I mean, I grew up in dentistry at a time where uh, I found gratitude by doing uh, gold inlays and onlays, and it, it wasn't from people going, God, I love the look. I mean, I had to yeah. find internal gratitude to be able to um, to do dentistry in an interdisciplinary setting where when you do good dentistry, you're actually making people healthy. I, I can't imagine the, the, how valuable that's going to be and how um, impactful that's going to be. Um, the, the other part of it, I guess, is what I would recommend they do. Obviously, they need to be trained because this isn't being taught in dental school, at least not the way that we're talking about it here. There are lots of dental, not lots, but there are a few dental schools getting involved in the sleep apnea component of it and making appliance and that. Um, but very few are really talking about preventing the problem from happening and um, just for lots of different reasons, mostly political uh, within the school and and evolutions in dental school happen to take quite a quite a long time to do. Um, but when they get out to and make that investment, and there are lots of investments that they are going to be asked to make. I mean, already in the price of dental school was, was one of those investments. But when they get into private practice and the pressures of private practice start um, piling up and they're worried about paying bills, 
I think one of the things that actually can relieve some of that stress and actually make them feel better about their day is when they can help people and when they can make a difference in a person's life. Um, even if it happens to seem like it's a throwaway at the moment, the return on the investment is huge because these patients not only will refer more patients to them um, if you can make their, let's say, their young child better, um, but almost all the adult patients that you're going to try to make better will require some degree of orthodontics or they will require restorative dentistry after that treatment is done. And so if you find a and develop a healthy dentistry practice, I think it, it would be a wonderful way to sort of separate yourself from the corporate environment quicker. Amen, buddy. I do. Th I just completely love what you said. Dentistry is incredibly exciting for these kids coming out. And number two, you could apply this to anything. I don't care what you go in, but when you focus on being an expert, people find you. They, I mean, people are now flying to your office. You never would have dreamed this, but people are like flying long distances because they say to you, you're the guy I hear that can help me. And that's a pretty cool place to be. Yeah. You know, which and I know um, just there's no reason they should have to fly to see me. Right. Right, right, right. Um, honestly, I'm, I'm not, you know, I have no special knowledge or gifts. I just have an interest and have continued to keep my eyes open as to what the next step is and what's, what's out there. They really ought, everybody ought to be able to do this. This is, it's not that hard or I wouldn't have been able to figure it out. So, yeah. um, you, you ought to be able to come your, your town's expert um, pretty quickly and really start helping a lot of people out. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're a young dentist watching this, you already know this guy is an expert. That's why he's one of the busiest speakers in the country. And Jeff, your courses are all sold out. We can't, you can't even get to see them if you want to, but you do have one on December 15th and 16th that is open. Just can you tell us what that is? If somebody uh, wanted to yeah. learn more about this, what is that course and how do I get to see it? So we have, uh, we teach, I teach out at uh, the Spear Education Center in Scottsdale. That's the main place. I do study clubs every, every week as well, but the main uh, hub of where I try to take most people is to Spear Education. Um, the December 15th, 16th course is at Spear Education in Scottsdale. It's a two day course going over airway prosthodontics, which is a study of the airway's impact on the stomatonathic system. And it gives you the foundation for beginning to become the expert in your own community. Um, we also have multiple workshops right now. I think it'll be that it'll be late next year before you could get into one. But what they're doing is taking names so that as people continue to move or shift, uh, they're able to slide people in. One of them is coming up in October this year. Then I think it's March and October next year. So we've got three scheduled right now. The other thing they can do is if they get on with um, Spear Education, they can keep them updated because we may be offering uh, more courses as things continue to shake out as this continues to gain in popularity. Yeah, it's good stuff, buddy. Well, I appreciate having you. Now, if people want to get a hold of you directly, how can we get a hold of you directly? You know, probably the easiest way is J Rouse. So J, the letter J, R O U S E, at spereducation.com. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you, brother. Stick around here for just a second while we say goodbye to everybody else. But thank you guys for watching. If you found today's episode valuable, do me a huge favor and just hit the share button. We'd love if you share the information with your friends. Keep sending us requests on things that you want to see, and we'll do our best to get them on the show. And uh, until we see you next time, keep watching the best practices show. You guys have a great rest of your day. Thank you.